the thing makes the early line. We are live right here on Sports Grid on a Monday morning. I'm Kevin Walsh, joined by Donnie Wright side. DRS, how you feeling? Feeling good here. How about this week here, Kevin? Right? Not much Major League Baseball going out, but you know what? The pros are in the building today, and we'll make sure you guys have an actionable week here on the Sports Grid Network. I'm ready. Can't you tell? Yeah, certainly so. There's a lot for yeah. us to get into, some huge Major League Baseball headlines, but we begin with the Open and a shout out to Cam Stewart because Cam Smith wins the Open 22 to 1 pre tournament, comes in and gets the job done with a massive, massive Sunday, multiple rounds, Donnie, of 64. Yeah, impressive stuff all the way through. And I got to tell you, yesterday, I left the house with Rory McIlroy with a few-shot lead. Went to the food store here, Kevin. Made some small talk with somebody. How about Rory McIlroy? Yeah, how about it? He's not even in first place. What? What's going on out here at the British Open? But that's the thing about golf. No matter how many strokes you are ahead, you still got to complete it. You can't, Kevin, as we like to say, run out the clock and win a championship. You have to execute all the way through. And, and Rory just didn't do that. And Cam Smith did. I will say it's it's tough for me to get a gauge on how much of this is, you know, uh, Rory falls short again. Rory's not able to cross the finish line. I understand that that is factual. Don, if you would have told Rory backers he goes 18 under at the open, I'm Ooh. pretty sure they would have double, tripled, or quadrupled their, their bets placed on him coming into the week. Yeah, you probably would have thought he also won by 10 strokes with an 18-under in a major championship, specifically yeah. at the British Open, and it wasn't even close at this point. Sensational golf all the way around. That course was to be had, and it got had. Awesome, awesome stuff. We'll talk more about the Open in our number two. Not just the guys at the top, but the guys at the back, because there certainly were some notable names who really did not have themselves a good first two days and then ended up missing the cut. In Major League Baseball, the big story right now is that the Washington Nationals are going to consider trading Juan Soto. They offer him a 15-year, $440 million deal. He declines that, and they now will consider potentially moving him before the early August trade deadline. Yeah, we're going to expand on this topic in the next segment, and rightfully so, because you're at an interesting crossroads here with Juan Soto. Unbelievable player. But is he too good a player to have on your baseball team? Sounds crazy, but we'll talk about it. And that number, $440 million, yeah. has been talked about a lot. It's an eye-popping number for people. I don't know where Donnie is on that. I made sure actually not to ask him before we got rolling here. Uh -huh. I feel like I might have a unique take, though, on the contract, although it wouldn't surprise me Donnie and I often agree. The All-Star Game starts tomorrow. Today is the Home Run Derby. We will break that down in its entirety. One thing that we knew was going to happen, though, Donnie, some guys won't be out there and available, such as Garrett Cole and Justin Verlander, made their normal starts. We've also seen Mike Trout, who's now not going to be available for the All-Star Game. Feels like an NFL training camp roster at this point where you have your team set and over the next like one to two weeks where the voting takes place and also the pitchers lining up for it, guys dip in and dip out. So the team that you thought was going to be there, a lot of different shakeups here once they get to the field on Tuesday night. And I know there were a lot of frustrations from people, certain snubs, if you will. We've seen Freddie Freeman added, Ty France, and Devin Williams, a couple of the bigger names that people thought needed to be involved. So at some, I don't want to say they're correcting a wrong, but more guys starting to make it as others drop out. Our radio audience enters the fold here on this Monday morning. Kevin Walsh, Donnie, right side of the early line, Sirius XM, Channel 159, and you talk about baseball headlines, my goodness, the Seattle Mariners just keep this thing going. The Baltimore Orioles, and rightfully so, were the story for so long with their double-digit win streak. While that was going on, the Mariners were doing the exact same thing, except they have not stopped 14 consecutive wins for the Mariners. Yeah, Pacific Northwest catching fire here with the Mariners. And it's one of those things, Kevin, where you come up across the all-star dead or the all-star line and you say to yourself, all right, get some rest, relaxation, and come back and let's win in the second half. The Mariners are probably screaming, no, let's continue this win streak. Why are we having the all-star break at this time? Just the way it is. But, man, the Mariners are hot, hottest team in baseball. How about that? They, they absolutely are. And they have now joined a couple of teams as the co-fourth choice to win the American League overall 
at 16 to 1. As obviously baseball kind of pauses the day to day action, we'll be able to reset some of the futures markets, certainly on the FanDuel Sportsbook. Speaking of the futures market today, we'll talk a little NFL around the Arizona Cardinals as the reports coming out of the weekend at that, that they are likely to extend Kyler Murray during this offseason. And they should, and rightfully so, because you need to start the season in the NFL with everybody with their heads on straight, not worrying about if I get injured, I'm not going to get paid. I wanted to get paid. My team doesn't like me. What are they thinking here? Just pay the guy. He's a quarterback. Kick the can down the road, get the guy in the camp, and keep him happy. One interesting note, though, on Kyler is right now he does not have a season-long passing over-under like a lot of the big-name quarterbacks do. I do wonder if that is just some a cautious approach there from the FanDuel Sportsbook saying just in case this bleeds and just in case there's a holdout, we're not going to post those numbers on Kyler. Again, we'll break that down in its entirety. A couple of NBA stories that I think work kind of well positioned next to one another. The Blazers won the summer league over the weekend, which seemingly was a much less significant event to LeBron James showing up at the Drew League. And the next thing you know, the NBA, Donnie, is broadcasting Drew League basketball. Yeah, why isn't LeBron just showing up for the Lakers in their summer league game? Wouldn't that make much more sense here than going to play at the Drew League? But I can't hate. Guy performed, stepped up. Shout out there. Got DeMar DeRozan a dub. And certainly Uh-oh. he could use one. Kyrie did not show up, though, which is a whole other bag of tricks. Right now. Pharrell, coast to coast. We've been making fun of Johnny Goudreau for choosing <laughs> Columbus. People are more so disappointed with the narrative, right? And what came out from the Goudreau camp leading into free agency here. It's been rumored for like a decade now that he wanted to be a flyer. His good buddy Kevin Hayes is on the team. Like everything made sense from that perspective, but they couldn't shed salary. And I think it's very, very difficult in this league when everybody knows your intentions to shed salary. The Sports Grid Network. The morning after. It's interesting to see Texas with the second best odds because it's the narrative, the public perception of the Longhorns at all times. When will Texas be back? They have a plus 160 number to win double digit games, to win 10 or more games in 2022. So certainly that has to be the expectation to take anybody seriously if they ask the question, is Texas back? The Sports Grid Network. The early line. Indiana Pacers, 133 million over four years, biggest offer sheet of all time. And within the hour, we hear that the Phoenix Suns will match. The guy is a young, really good player that has done nothing but compete on the basketball court and do good things for your team, which is typically in the NBA. You fight over those guys. We're not losing this guy. We'll sign him to whatever he wants. We want him to be happy just here in Phoenix. But it's just kind of odd how this roundabout spectrum came to this. Only on Sports Grid. Pro Football Doc has found its new home right here with Sports Injury Central. And with that comes our expansion into other sports. Sports Injury Central will give you nonstop exclusive injury analysis from experienced team doctors from all three major sports. Doctors with resumes that include teams like the Chicago Bulls, the Texas Rangers, and the LA Chargers. So gain a fantasy DFS and betting edge right now for free at SICscore.com. Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less Rogers games. And the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell, coast to coast. That's where they win cups. Stanley Cups over there. Give me the game practice. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game live all like access. Mandy. I like Mandy against Bam. I think Mandy can win the game, take a point. In game oh, live oh, prime yeah, time. The major, the PGA champion. In yes. game live overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. Back 
right here on the early line. Let's kind of get into the Juan Soto conversation. The Nationals are going to consider trading Juan Soto, but that, I guess, for some, is burying the lead. This is a result of him turning down a 15-year, $440 million contract. And I said that I might have a unique take here. Again, we'll see where DRS lands on this. But what I have noticed from most people is their reaction is, oh my goodness, Juan Soto turned down $440 million. And to that, I tell you, good. And if he had not done that, his agent would be one of the very, very worst in the history of sports. Donnie, the $440 million contract offered to Juan Soto is a horrible, horrible contract for him. He is 23 years old. He should have no desire to lock himself in to a sub $30 million a year contract when there are more than 15 players this year in Major League Baseball making 30 plus million. Soto very easily could secure a seven year deal north of 35 million per, I almost guarantee it, and come free at the age of 30 years old and secure a second contract, probably a decade long, and ultimately net an extra $100 million if he were to instead go that route as opposed to this $440 million contract. I gotcha. Half a billion almost. It sounds big. Donnie, that Nationals offer was rightfully turned down by Juan Soto. And it's two, it's twofold here, right? Because you're trying to take a look at Juan Soto and say, hey, you want all the you know comforts of life here? We'll give you 15 years guaranteed over $400 million. Where can you go wrong? Well, if you're a player that believes in his abilities and you want to maximize your dollars, it doesn't make sense in order to sign that. But also, let's take a look at the Washington Nationals here. This is the perspective we're coming from, which they really didn't want to pay Bryce Harper. They let him walk. They couldn't pay Anthony Rendon. Let him walk. You also have Max Scherzer, one of the best pitchers in baseball, one of the best shortstops in baseball, Trey Turner. Turner eventually didn't want to pay them. So now they're wallowing in last place here, which is hilarious because you want to pay dollars for guys like Juan Soto when you want to win championships. I know you can't equate this, Kevin, and let's just say the Los Angeles Angels and Mike Trout. They're in a bigger market here, but it's sort of the same premise. Let me put all my eggs in one basket, which again is one of nine guys that gets to come up to the plate and doesn't include the pitcher. Do you really want to pay that much money? And if you're the, the Nationals, what are you actually doing here? Because quite frankly, if you're taking a look at a deep-pocketed ownership group who had the, as much talent as the Nationals had, they would be playing for a World Series again this year, but yet they're in last place. It doesn't make sense to say, I'm not going to pay anybody, but finally pay Juan Soto, so we have nothing around Juan Soto, and we're a last-place ball club. I don't know what the Nationals are going to end up doing, but I got to tell you right now, just on the uh, like you know premise of let's sign Juan Soto and build, it sounds like he's going to make so much money. Let's sign Juan Soto and come in last place, but tell our fans, hey, come out to the ballpark and see Juan Soto. Yeah, but my problem again with that is they're not going to pay him $440 million for one year. Donnie, imagine I told you, hey, Juan Soto just signed for under $30 million a year. That's lunacy. Anthony Rendon off the World Series run got over thirty-five per year. I mean... I understand that that Rendon was great, but Rendon is now over th is already over 30 years old in the disaster that everything is going on with the Angels, who can, should continue to blow it up here. But it, the idea that if Soto would have said yes, and again, he didn't because it was the right decision, the Nationals then wouldn't have been able to put more pieces around Soto is a complete misnomer. They have no desire to do so. I almost think what the Nationals did was a brilliant piece of PR here. I am sure a ton of people, I'm sure local Washington radio, what is Juan Soto doing? He doesn't want to be here. He doesn't really want to be. Because, oh, how could he turn all that money down? Do you know how much $440 million would change my life? Folks, the Nationals here did a brilliant piece of PR. Nobody even knows who's going to be the owner in five years in Washington, essentially, is how the story really goes here. They're now going to be able to trade him. They're going to get back an otherworldly haul, assuming that all lines up, because they didn't make a legitimate— I'm sorry, Donnie, you cannot tell me that Juan Soto, at the age of 23, viewed as one of the most valuable players in the entirety of this sport, should have locked himself into 15 years of under $30 million per year. There's no way. 
but it still is for over $400 million. It's a lot of the times where these younger guys, like even take a look at the Atlanta Braves with like, you know, Ronald Acuna, getting those early deals to buy at their arbitration. But also, no matter what happens in your career, you are already taken care of. So, I mean, Soto, money is money. You're right. If you're going on a dollar per year average, he should do the Carlos Correa. He will sign 15 years, but every single year, I have an opt-out clause that I can be a true free agent and go wherever I want, which means, okay, I made 30 this year. Oh, I hit 50 home runs. Yeah, I deserve way more than that. Let me opt out of this and get a five-year, you know, $300 million contract from the Los Angeles Dodgers. And then, oh yeah, I'm like 29 years old and I can do that again. I hear you on that overall, but it's a two-pronged attack here. Number one, what are the Nationals going to get out of this contract? for him, giving him all that longevity. Number two, what is Juan Soto going to get out of it? Will he be comfortable? Will he be complacent? Will he be after three years going, man, we stink. I want to get traded to a contender here. And then what do you get up for him in a package at that point? They're coming to a crossroads right now, but I think the point is valid that you did bring up. Juan Soto made it a point to say, Kevin, hey, look, I negotiate everything behind the scenes. Like nobody's going to hear any dollar numbers until I say yes or no. And it seems like it reached a point behind the scenes that the Nationals go, Watch this. Let's just put out the number we're offering Soto. It's going to blow everybody's mind, and we're going to put it on record that he turned it down. So our front office, again, who lets everybody out the door who's any good because we don't want to pay them. Guys, what did you want us to do? We offered him almost $500 million, and he told us no. You're right. That Curry's public favor there. And that is why I think it's very likely that they're going to trade Juan Soto because they're almost trying to, hey, we, we did our best here. We, we did our yeah. absolute best here on a deal. They didn't, by the way. Because, again, if Soto wraps it around, uh, listen, enough of this 15-year nonsense. Let's do an eight-year deal. And, by the way, he'd probably be able to net $300 million on an eight-year contract, which would mean then after that eight-year contract, he would need to get seven years at $20 million annual to match his, this current 440 offer. I mean, at the age of 31, does anyone here think that Juan Soto would struggle to get $20 million per year? You can't even be... Again, unless people think Juan Soto is going to fall off the face of the earth, which I struggle to believe. So the question I have to you now is, because we'll be able to expand on this story throughout the week and the build-up to the deadline here, is at this very moment, do you believe Juan Soto will be traded during this season? Uh, I do not. I do not think so, because I think the PR hit will be too damaging here for the Nationals. I think they let it ride out. I think they come to their senses here and probably make one of those, you know, all right, let's cut it down in half. Let's give you a lot of money. Let's re, you know, take a look at this in a couple years. I don't think they can trade him, to be honest with you. I don't. I really don't. Oh, I think he will be traded, because I, I do think it's going to get to the point where he no longer really wishes to be there either. He should realize that they're a, a team that, not only they traded Scherzer and Trey Turner last deadline. Yeah. Like, to be honest with you, they kind of at least have some familiarity with a trade of this magnitude in season. They've tried to position themselves as we did the best we could with the offer that we made. And also, something you alluded to, why does Juan Soto want to stay there? The second they hand him over whatever contract he agrees to, then within, what, two weeks they're going to turn it around and say, well, what do you want us to do? We're paying Juan Soto more money than we can afford even though Strasburg's making, again, over $30 million annual here. Like, if anything, if you're Soto, you should push to get out of Washington. It's a waste of your time. This feels a lot like the Giancarlo Stanton situation down in Miami where they gave him a boatload of cash, and then three days later, like, oh, man, why did we do that? Let's see if we can sell him to another team at this point here. It's going to end. It feels like it's going to end badly in Washington because from their perspective, if they do get him signed, they're going to have to up the you know, annual value of the contract to 35 or $40 million. They're not going to be able to sign anybody else. It's like the guy is so good that it's hard to sign him or trade him. Think about that. He's so good, Kevin, it's too hard to keep him or trade him here. You should be able to find a way to trade him, though, but apparently we're going to go down another path, though. At some point, I think Donnie's brain will explode, where teams are going to be stingy over the prospects they're willing to give up for 23-year-old Juan some of the prospects are older than Juan Soto. My goodness gracious, the baseball headlines roll on it. The early line. 
Mike Evans is the favorite to actually lead the NFL in receiving touchdowns. And Mike Evans has been so consistent in his NFL career before Tom got there. It's obviously stayed with Brady in tow. I look at Mike Evans as maybe a bit of value here. Could he get out to one of those leads over the first five weeks? Hey, five straight weeks, Mike Evans has been over 100 yards and has caught a touchdown pass in each and every game they've played. I can easily see that here. Only on Sports Grid. The morning after. The Yankees, Dodgers, Astros, maybe another team who has been the best team in all of the bigs in the first half of the Major League Baseball season. What really intrigues me is still the Astros, Ben. You know, like that to me is the team that doesn't get really talked about enough. Uh, it's going to be really compelling to me to see what happens at the trade deadline. I think that it could be make or break for some teams for sure. And I don't think that Houston is afraid to make that big deal. The Sports Grid Network. Betting above the rim. LeBron James will sign an extension come August. That's the next domino you got to watch for LA. And look for a motivated LeBron James. They can keep Russ involved and motivated. you got to think that the Lakers are going to be better. I'm not talking win the NBA title. But you can see them as maybe in a four to six seed. Betting above the rim. You might be the next Daily Fantasy Millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. Sports Professor Rick Haro into the $1.3 trillion business of sports here at St. Andrews. About 300 yards right behind those trees from the 150th British Open. But there is other sports news going on. How about the, quote, loose affiliation discussions between the ACC and the Pac-12? Pac-12 has some reduction of TV rights from about $42 million a team to 30 with UCLA and USC gone. And the ACC has cost certainty because of their contract, the SPN, through 2032 and longer. So while it's not the big boys, the SEC and the Big Ten, they do have a chance to maneuver to a, quote, loose alliance, they say, which might include a championship game in Vegas every year or somewhere else. Point is, musical chairs at the team level and at the conference level. And while we're excited about stuff over here, there's a lot going on on the other side of the pond. Before we get into kind of some of the results that took us into the break, we did have yesterday's MLB draft, which was interesting to follow because the FanDuel Sportsbook did provide us odds for the first overall pick. This is something that for a while was likely to be Drew Jones. For those that have not followed this uh, super closely there, or really even at all, because I know the MLB draft doesn't obviously, you know, draw the attention like an NBA or NFL draft does. But Drew Jones was supposed to be the first overall pick. That is the son of Atlanta Brave legend uh, Andrew Jones. So the idea was that this guy was going to go first overall. When these odds came available, he's a minus money favorite to be the first pick off for the board. And eventually this starts to move a little bit. In comes Brooks Lee as a favorite at one point over minus 250 on the FanDuel Sportsbook. And this was on, I think, Friday, because I believe Donnie and I were finishing up Moneyline at the time, trying to figure out his status there to be the first overall pick. The move comes in. Okay, it seems like it's going to be him. But once again, we continue to see the ebbs and flows of draft betting. Tremar Johnson finishes up now at about a minus 155 on the FanDuel Sportsbook. At one point, higher than that number, but the closing final number there was Tremar Johnson, the favorite, a minus 155. And for those that are following along on the, uh, the MLB draft broadcast, right before the pick is announced, Tremar Johnson is shown taking a phone call. And it's a, well, pretty obvious there. Anybody that's ever watched a draft knows the phone call comes in right before the pick. Bang, bang, boom. You excited to join our organization? You're excited to become a Baltimore Oriole? There you go. So I'm excited. I grabbed a piece of the Tremar Johnson deal. 
And next thing you know, it's Jackson Holiday. A wild ride comes in at better than 10 to 1 on the closing number, Jackson Holiday, to be the first overall pick. For those that do not know, Jackson Holiday is actually the son of Matt Holiday. Colorado Rockies, St. Louis Cardinals for many, many years. I think finished it up with the Yanks, or at least one of his final teams was the New York Yankees. Matt Holiday there. So that was a fun uh, bit of uh, drama to watch play out, really, because sometimes we hear teams, ah, we're considering five guys, we're considering four guys, whatever it might be. They really did seem to have a lot of uncertainty, or at least presented it, that there was a lot of uncertainty in that Baltimore Orioles draft room about what they were going to do at the first overall selection One other, and Drew Jones comes off the board second, right? That was notable in its own right. But what was another fascinating thing was Kumar Rocker, the Vanderbilt pitcher, remember, next to Al uh, Leiter's son, who was selected 10th overall last year by the New York Mets, comes back into this draft and comes off third overall. Ultimately, the, the way the money works out there, I think he does come back, gets a little bit more money. How much does he hurt himself from a, a timeline perspective? Not so sure. The other obviously interesting thing, though, is it had a lot to do with health. There was a lot of concern around those physicals. If Kumar Rocker is good to go, perhaps the Texas Rangers, even third overall, which is a high bit of a you know a high draft capital to use, maybe a bit of a steal because this guy was selected last year inside the top ten. So many people would tell you maybe he shouldn't have even been in this draft. Quickly, Don, before we get to some of the other interesting stuff there, anything from the MLB draft catch your attention? Yeah, I thought it was interesting. I, I thought, you know, the number one overall pick being Holiday and also from a betting perspective, we're typically, I like to say in the past, Kevin, we knew who these number one, number two, number three picks would be. But in the past couple of weeks alone, the NBA draft followed up here by the MLB draft is fantastic because it used to be paint by numbers. Hey, look, here goes all the line movement. It's clear that somebody leaked this information out. And quite frankly, when you look at these war rooms for even Major League Baseball, there must have been like 30 or 40 people in some of these rooms. Nobody was leaking this information ahead of time. Or we led to believe, Kevin, an hour before the draft, you finally made up your mind at this point. And secondarily here, Kumar Rocker goes number three overall, which looked like one of those guys that could have went number one overall last year. How about this? His medicals were so bad. The Mets were like, you know what? We're not going to sign him at any cost, knowing that Cohen is our owner with more money than God. And even he passed up signing Kumar Rocker. So the fact that he went number three overall the following year, and seems like there's no real issues with his medical. We'll find out in a couple years if he's headed for shoulder surgery, Tommy John surgery, whatever it may be. But if you're looking from a perspective of you can't get enough pitching, the past couple years here for the Texas Rangers, they got some power arms now to deal with. Yeah, certainly, again, interesting to follow. The one tough thing, I think part of the reason the MLB draft doesn't captivate people is we're not going to hear from oh, these kids yeah. for what? Five years? Give or oh, t- yeah. You know what I mean? So that's obviously, it's, yep. it's hard to get all excited and uh, and whatnot. We'll see, though, as that starts to develop there. A couple of interesting stories throughout baseball. I do think we have to talk a little bit about the Mariners. We mentioned this in our headlines. You're 14 consecutive wins. This was a team that went for it in the offseason. Early starts of the year was a real struggle. Baseball's hottest team with really no close second as they hit the all-star break. Yes, and also we're taking a look here, 51 and 42, Kevin. Before the season started with the expectations the Seattle Mariners had, you're right. We expected them to be 51 and 42. That's not an unbelievable record where, wow, nobody saw this coming. I'll tell you what nobody saw coming was how poorly they started the year. Now, when you win 14 games in a row, Major League Baseball, you're going to make some headlines and you're going to move up in the standings. But this team was close to the playoffs last year, retooled this lineup, add some pitching, added some hitting, and here we go, and off into the second half. Maybe this is one of those teams where, again, they're not going to challenge for the division title because the Houston Astros are far and away the best team in that division. But it's good to see for Seattle baseball here where maybe they can retool even more at the deadline and make a push. Once you get into the playoffs, as you like to say, anything can happen. But it's a wonderful story here for the Mariners, who we thought would be good before the season started, not so much when the season started, to have the trade deadline being the hottest team in Major League Baseball. What is interesting, though, is that on the season numbers, you know, for a guy like a Jesse Winker, I mean, he's batting 230, right? Like, you see how some of those struggles have carried over there. Adam Frazier batting 237. Ty France makes an all-star team. And one of the other big thing, uh, big things for the Seattle Mariners team is Julio Rodriguez. Has he blown past expectations? Big expectations. J-Rod is one of the, is he one of the 10 best hitters in Major League Baseball? He might just be already. 
So it goes to show how much of a difference a guy like that can make, and he's absolutely made it here now on the season, batting 275, 16 homers, 52 RBIs. 52 RBIs does lead the team. So really impressive stuff from Seattle overall. A 16-1 to price right now to win the American League, nine back of the Houston Astros. As we look for some other stories in baseball, the Yankees series finale with the Boston Red Sox, I think kind of is twofold there. It's the Yankees who lose a home series to the Cincinnati Reds, drop the first game of the set, getting back, getting right, 20-plus runs over the final two games of the series. But there's also Chris Sale injured in the first inning a ball comes off the finger for a Red Sox team that's really struggling. They cannot beat anybody in the AL East at all. They haven't won a single series in the AL East Yet, and we are at the all-star break here. And now Boston kind of has to figure out, are they going to have to go out there and start buying, pitching, if we have a sale injury? Or maybe a team with a lot of impending free agents, Donnie, consider selling off. Oh, the tale of two seasons, or should we say one season, right? Entering into this season, you're saying to yourself for the Boston Red Sox, not really sure where they fit in the AL East, but they're going to be competitive. They'll probably make the playoffs here. So their first start was like, oh my goodness, is Rafael Devers going to end up on the Dodgers or somewhere else in baseball because it's going to be a massive sell-off because it's not happening here. Then they sort of get hot and say, this is the Red Sox that we anticipated this year. We'll see if Chris Sale comes back. We'll see if they make deadline moves in their favor to sort of build momentum for the second half of Major League Baseball season. And then we see them three and ten, excuse me, three and seven in their last ten games, sitting at forty-eight and forty-five, back in fourth place in this division. It's almost like nothing. The more things change, the more things stay the same. Where you thought they were going to get hot, not challenge the Yankees, but maybe challenge for second place and certainly a playoff spot here in the American League. And quite frankly, now they're just floundering in the water. One of those teams that was happy, Kevin. The All Star deadline is coming up here for them. Again, uh, at that part of it is true, but. When they brought Trevor Story in, there were questions about what they were going to do with Xander Bogarts in terms of paying him. He's a legitimate free agent at the end of the year. Do you think there is a chance that a Boston Red Sox, despite the fact that, what's the worst case scenario? Five back, worst case scenario. Five back of the last wild card spot by the time we hit the deadline. J.D. Martinez maybe is a better and more appropriate guy to bring up here. Is there a chance that they take the phone calls and consider shipping out some of their big bats? They shouldn't. They absolutely shouldn't do this. And you're trying to take a look at a Boston Red Sox franchise that, what, you know, halfway up Connecticut all the way up through the state of Maine, they own all that real estate here. It's big money. They're sold out every single night. You should be operating this way. It's almost like the Chicago Cubs win a World Series and ownership goes, yeah, we gave you your one World Series every 100 years. Now it's time for us to make money in the other 99 seasons. It doesn't make sense here that the Red Sox are doing this. And quite frankly, it's like back-to-back mm-hmm. years, Kevin, when they came into the season going, well, let's just see what happens as opposed to seizing the day, going after the Bryce Harpers of the world, the big money free agents, retooling that team because this isn't a Pittsburgh Pirates operation where it's on a you know shoestring budget and we have to make every bit of ends meet here just to field a basic team that's not the case here I don't know what they're doing so the jokes were yeah let's give up Devers and Bogarts they're the guys you're supposed to sign but also keep in mind you also let Mookie Betts oh we can't afford the Boston Red Sox Hmm. couldn't afford Mookie Betts I don't know what's going on with that organization right now yeah very very odd to figure out what they're going to do let me bring this up though quickly because again on the Yankees aspect of it two dominant games one of the reasons the Yankees are dominant is the active current Best hitter in Major League Baseball. No, it's not Aaron Judge. It's not DJ LeMayhew. Statistically, it's Matt Carpenter. Matt Carpenter leads Major League Baseball in everything, literally, since he's been since he has shown up in Yankee Stadium. Batting average, OPS, homers, and RB. Donnie, I know it sounds ridiculous, but you've done since you've been doing your home run props. Does Matt Carpenter not check the box every single night? Yeah, just, he just about does, which is incredible stuff, because when he left his St. Louis tenure, it was looking like he was just a shot player that couldn't even get the baseball out of the infield, now routinely hitting for power on a night-to-night basis on a team that, quite frankly, doesn't even need his bat. It's just an add-on here, and it's been fantastic for him. He is now rocked up, though. He bats like fifth in the lineup, one of the most important players. Such an interesting situation. But Frank will be right back. Your 
hearts racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Gam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. Fantasy Sports Today. Let's talk about Miles Sanders here. At this point, I don't know that there's going to be a lot of people feeling like he's going to be reliable going into the season. I think there's definitely the temptation to look at Miles Sanders and be like, this guy is so disappointing. It's like every season you think he's going to do it and he never does. I am buying low and I'm mostly buying low because I just think the Eagles are probably going to be pretty good. I mean, the team was one of the most effective rushing touchdown teams in the entire NFL. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. If Durant feels stuck and he feels like I'm not going to find a home that I want, which is Phoenix, Miami, Los Angeles, it, you know, he don't want to go play in Memphis or Oklahoma City or Minnesota. He don't want to play in those places. At that point, he's going to look at Kyrie and go, I probably have to stay. Why don't you stay too? Why don't we all stay? And it becomes more feasible that they're going to be back in Brooklyn. The Sports Grid Network. In game live. Cameron Young, hats off to this guy. 18 months ago, wasn't even on the PGA tour. He was barely on the court for a tour. He didn't take any backward steps. We go, okay, this is a young guy. He's having a couple of good weeks. He's not going to keep stringing them together. But when he can drive that many par fours off the tee, he put himself in the mix. And that's a name we've got to watch moving forward. Cameron Young hits an absolute mile. He's 25 years of age. Catch the program every single day on the Sports Grid Network. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or TuneIn, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. Major League Baseball storylines that are worthy of mention before we get to some NFL action here. The Phillies versus the Marlins. Now, you usually would see this right over recent times. Like, well, okay, the Phillies won. What, what's the story here? To put into perspective what Donnie has told people on this show nonstop, the Phillies can't beat the Marlins. For the first time since 2010, think about how many bad Marlins teams we have had since <laughs> 2010, the Phillies sweep the Miami Marlins. Yeah, the Phillies were pretty good back in the day, too, like 2010, 2011, you know, the 2012. They actually had really good baseball teams against a subpar Marlins team. But you're right, not sweeping a three-game series versus the Miami Marlins in over a decade, which is incredible stuff. And also, let's keep in mind that the Philadelphia Phillies here, Kevin, heading into the All-Star break, leaking oil, not playing well in Toronto. And you remember talking about on Friday, first game of this series, who do you have? Sandy Alcantara on the mound. So you figure that was going to bleed into another loss and those woes kick in on Saturday. Saturday and Sunday, not the case. The Philadelphia Phillies were excellent on the mound, very good in the bullpen, and got some timely clutch hitting. Now, this all of a sudden goes from a team that was leaking oil into the break to sweeping the Marlins and saying, okay, what's next? When's Bryce Harper coming back? What can we do to expand on this? Heading out of the break, taking on, I believe, the Cubs on Friday. We'll see what happens because another bad baseball team is going to come to town, and maybe the Phillies can actually start a win streak wrapped around the All-Star break. Yeah, obviously that was a tough run there. But to be able to sweep the Marlins like that. Look, on the road, they only allowed one run to Miami in those three games. 
I know the Marlins offense is not littered with all-stars. I don't care who you see. That is an impressive run from the Phils. I'll tell you what's not impressive, though, right now. A struggling Milwaukee Brewer baseball team. I do not understand this, though. This has puzzled me, and it's puzzled me nonstop here. Why are the Brewers minus 230 a half game up on the St. Louis Cardinals? It doesn't make any sense. The Cardinals play a little bit better ball going into the break. They've got a better run differential here. I, how are the Brewers minus 230, Donnie, right now when we are lining up the odds in the NL Central? I guess just projections here of what we anticipate where you say to yourself, now hold on. The best pitching staff, for starters, is where? It's in Milwaukee in this division. The best bullpen in the division is where? It's in Milwaukee. And all right, a capable lineup, as I like to say here, you know, buoyed by Kristen Yelich, a little Rowdy Telez in there. But when you're looking overall, are we just waiting? Is this, and I, and I, I guess the, the factoring process is, did they listen to a lot of the shows last year down the stretch where I kept telling you, man, the Cardinals aren't making the playoffs. I don't care who's in there. Well, eventually somebody does have to make the playoffs, and the Cardinals actually did yeah. that. But it feels like there is a lot of that where you're just saying, well, their pitching is better. Eventually it's going to last. Now, granted, we're roughly a little bit more than halfway through the season and through the rest of July mm-hmm. and August. Maybe that comes to fruition here where those power arms really show up and shut it down. But I got to tell you, it just feels like almost, Kevin, Nobody is pushing these two teams, the Cardinals and the Brewers. I think they just look at each other in the standings. Ah, win some, lose some, win some, lose some, because the Pirates, Cubs, and Reds aren't going to come out of nowhere and come chase them down. We'll see where it ends up the regular season the rest of the way. But, I mean, an injury to maybe a a key player in your bullpen, whether it be Williams or Hayter, an injury to one of those power arms in the front of the rotation, things can change quickly. And also, let's keep in mind, the trade deadline's coming up. Maybe the Cardinals go out and make a move like a Luis Castillo and sort of ramp up their, their front. But you're right. It does seem like a little bit high of a price to pay at this point in the season on the Brewers. For some people, the Cardinals are the most logical landing spot for Juan Soto. If they trade for Juan Soto, I, I almost can guarantee you they move to the favorite to win this division. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen. That's obviously a lot. But that's probably the way this plays out. And I'll put it to you in one other respect. Last year at the All-Star break, we were diving into the live numbers that were updated for us, playoff odds, this, that, and the third. It was when Donnie had told people the Braves were going to win the end at least, and it's when I had bet the Blue Jays to miss the postseason. We had some success with it. I want to know what the odds are for the Brewers to miss the playoffs. Minus 230 to win the division? What are they, a minus 500 to make the playoffs? Donnie, they have the same amount of losses as the Phillies and the Giants, who, by the way, right now, are not one of the top two teams in the NL wildcard race there. So this is not some type of guarantee that Milwaukee is going to walk into this postseason here. Fascinating numbers to follow. When we talk about Cardinals, though, it's not just St. Louis that grabs the attention. It's, of course, the Arizona Cardinals as well. A big decision coming for them on Kyler Murray, although I don't really understand what is difficult about this decision. Do you think Kyler Murray is your franchise quarterback? Then pay him. And it looks like that's going to be the conclusion that this situation will be reaching the reports over the weekend. The Cardinals are becoming increasingly more likely to pay Kyler Murray before this season gets underway. It comes as maybe a bit of a surprise, the timing. I thought maybe this would escalate a little bit more, maybe get uglier throughout the process, but I'm glad it isn't. Cooler heads perhaps prevailing in Arizona as they are inching closer to extending Kyler Murray. You know, it's interesting you say that, too, because you say cooler heads will prevail. Weren't we just talking about just a couple months ago here? Kyler Murray taking out full-page ads in the paper, basically lambasting the Arizona Cardinals here. Why I want to be here. I want to get paid. I want to leave this football team. So a lot of guys respond differently to those sort of headlines and sort of to that money where it's like Lamar Jackson. Now, we'll see where he pans out. But over the years, it's like, hey, we want to pay Lamar. And I was like, you know what? And don't worry about the money right now. Money's going to take care of itself, and rightfully so. He's probably going to end up making $50 million a year. But Kyler Murray is saying, all right, at the stroke of midnight, where I'm available to get an extension on my rookie contract, I want that, and it went top dollar here. And the organization goes, now hold on. We love you, kid. We do. You're still under contract. You haven't proven us to that you're worth 35 to $40 million a year. So instead of saying, okay, I understand that, I'll show you and I'll play my hand by going out and being a great quarterback in the NFL in 2022 and then do it again in 2023 and force you to make those, you know, who knows where the franchise tag's going to be, $50 million, $60 million a year at that point. Mm, He's mm, going to mm, get his mm, funds. Mm, mm. But if I'm looking here, Kevin, at the Arizona Cardinals myself, why are you doing this? 
Like, are you really going to put the screws here to your quarterback, knowing that he could go south at any moment in his head, like we were getting the reports out of last year, late in the season, checking out of games and not being happy here? If you're going to ruin your 2022 season over a couple million dollars, Arizona, go ahead and do it. Again, when I, you try to oh, is this guy franchise quarterback? If you put him on the open market, how fast would the Eagles yes, call correct. you? Might, maybe, it might be the new bar to figure out here. I'll tell you right now, Arizona, and this I'm a Jalen Hurts guy through and through, especially compared to Donnie Wright's out. I'll tell you that much. Mm. They call up, and they say, hey, listen, we want a couple picks in Jalen Hurts before they finish the sentence Jalen is in the desert. I'm telling you right now. Like, this, this would be done without hesitation for the folks in Philadelphia. And the other thing, too, people say, oh, why – why are these guys trying to rush to, to, to get their money? Well, well, one, if you can come into the money, why would you wait? Go out there and get the dollar signs. But also, lest we forget, Kyler Murray, as you see the odds right there for MVP, along with passing yards and passing touchdowns, he was the MVP favorite at one point. Am I, am, am I, if I'm not mistaken there, when the Arizona Cardinals Best team couldn't football, be beat. Maybe. I mean, they yeah. were unstoppable last year at one point, the Arizona Cardinals. A 7-0 start to their season. Now, and then eventually Kyler banged up at the end of the Green Bay game. It was their first loss. They had some struggles with and without him. It all kind of varied there. But if you're Kyler, right, not only are you the type of quarterback who has to or likes to use his legs where teams will try and hold that against you, ooh, you could be hurt at any minute, but also you're not going to have to go play a gang of games without the Andre Hopkins. I'm not risking any of that there. Pay me now or I'm not showing up. And if you're the Cardinals, you know that this is your guy. So what are we even talking about? I, I don't know. And, and that's the issue here because you're right. The, the fact of the matter is it's not as if you could say to yourself, we'll cut you and nobody will pay. Don't you remember all the old, you know, old school NFL tales where an offensive lineman would go in like the day before the season starts and the team would be like, hey, you're making $2 million. We're going to cut you back to one. I don't want to take that pay cut. Well, if we cut you, probably nobody will sign you. All right, I'll take that $1 million. In a free market society here, if he hits it, there's 15 teams looking to bend over backwards to make him one of the highest paid players in football. But I understand Arizona has them under control. So you don't just give in right away. But also, let's take a look from an Arizona Cardinals perspective here. And let's say on a 17-game schedule, you have Kyler Murray healthy for those 17 games. Hopkins is coming back. You have a guy in Cliff Kingsbury who wants to run 150 plays a game. You also have A.J. Green, Hopkins, and then Brown, who you acquired in the offseason from the Baltimore Ravens. What do you think type of season is he going to have? Are you saying to yourself, you know what, let's bet against Kyler in 2022 and show him that he's not going to have that good a season so we can get him at a cheaper number the following year. It doesn't make sense. If you pay the guy, he has an outstanding year. You saved money. And as we always like to say, like, the price of the brick always goes higher and higher. Do we think mm -hmm. if we're the Cardinals, you're getting a discount after this season? How did that work with Dak Prescott? How's that working in Baltimore? It never works that way with starting quarterbacks. It doesn't. Of course it doesn't. It's a great, it's a great, great point by you, right? Because, again, there's always going to be a team willing to pay Kyler Murray. There is. They're not going to be, oh, go ahead, go find a deal. All right, I found it. I actually have too many deals. Thanks, I'm gone. I don't want to be here anymore. And I think How about when Lamar Jackson gets too? paid, K-Dub? Like, how much? Like, you already saw Deshaun Watson. They can say as much as they want. Oh, it's a one off deal. Nobody's going to get that. Where do you yeah. see when Lamar Jackson breaks the bank? You don't think they're going to hold that up and say, okay, Lamar just got $50 million a year. I'm at least worth that now. Like, I don't understand. Like, if I am a, mm -hmm. a quarterback centric team that obviously most teams are, you need a quarterback to compete at a high level. Why are you waiting around when you know it might cost you double next year? I can't figure it out. Yeah, man, I. I cannot wait for that Lamar situation to play out. I'm I'm tempted to just put this aside and get into it now. At we some need it this week. at some point, we need it this week. at some yeah, I think we'll have plenty of time this week too to to break into it a little bit more. I'm curious, are you interested in any of these Kyler numbers though, passing touchdowns or yards or maybe just even the MVP market on its own? I think again, he was obviously in the race last year. It shows how important team success is to this award. Right now, 20 to 1, same exact number as a Lamar Jackson. Are you interested in any of the future numbers here on Kyler Murray? 
I mean, probably not from an MVP standpoint. I don't think he can get up to that level. But you also take a look at a 30-1 to price here to lead the league here in touchdown passes. Again, it's a passing league. And you say to yourself, well, maybe if the, if Hopkins was here for all 17 games. But this is an offense that wants to go 100 miles an hour and give him every opportunity to do that. And those are high prices here because you're talking about Kyler Murray, 30-1 to here, passing touchdowns. Also, Lamar Jackson, 30-1. to And Tua Tagovailoa, 30-1. to Quite frankly, I take Kyler Murray more than all of those players here. So I think there is a little bit of value for Kyler Murray in the passing touchdowns market. Why? Because he plays for a coach that really wants to get after it and run 150 mm-hmm. plays a game, as I say. Yeah, I, I hear you on that. I'm interested in some of the season-long numbers on Kyler. What I mean by that is the over-under markets there, not just passing but rushing and see kind of how they're positioning him. The one thing with his MVP odds, though, right now is – there is a, an easy way to kind of understand how it becomes the conversation of Kyler Murray, right? If they are successful without DeAndre Hopkins and then can go to another level upon Hop's return and win an NFC West, it becomes fascinating. The hesitation, though, is they have the third best odds right now in that division, not even the second best odds, and it yeah. includes reigning defending Super Bowl champion L.A. Rams. It becomes super fascinating to see how good you think they're going to be. This is a team with a win total of nine and a half with plus 155 juice to the over, by the way. Kyler Murray is not winning anything near an MVP trophy at a nine and eight record. So there might become other ways you can bet the Cardinals if you are super high on them that doesn't include a Kyler Murray MVP ticket. Although, if they are fantastic and Kyler's in the MVP conversation, last year that meant Cliff Kingsbury was in the Coach of the Year conversation. We'll touch on that market as we close out our number one of the early line right here on Sports. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or TuneIn, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. Maurice Allen, 2015-2016 European Long Drive Tour Champion, 2017 World Number One. Me personally, I keep my game face on me all the time. Especially coming out of the bunker, leaving the range, or even leaving the course. What's your story? The morning after. 1350 and a half for both JT and Derrick Henry. Who do you got here? Probably even juice on both sides. We're going with JT or the man known as the King. I gotta go King Henry on this one. Bringing in Matt Ryan, he knows one thing, and that's that's kind of passing the ball and maybe being a little bit more efficient. Jonathan Taylor is an absolute yeah. stud, and we saw him beast out last year being the leading rusher, but Derrick Henry is the guy who's done it year after year after year. The Sports Grid Network. Betting above the rim. For Keegan, it's about opportunity and touches. If you look at every other guy on the top of that board, there's got to be guys that's going to put up stats and help their teams improve. I don't know if Keegan Murray is going to get the necessary touches in order for him to show his offensive ability. When you look at guys for Rookie of the Year, Hollow arguably could be the number one option. Betting above the rim. Fantasy Sports Today. Austin Riley of the Atlanta Braves. Look at the season that he's having. There's no discussion of him whatsoever. Flying under the radar, Jim, no doubt. He's putting up numbers that you see from like guys like from the Rays, Miguel Sano, without striking out 40% of the time like those guys do. I think that what he's doing is sustainable, especially in a, a good park, a great offense with a lot of protection around him. I think that uh, Riley, not fluky and probably not going away. The Sports Grid Network. 
the early line. You look at Kyle Pitts over under there, 875 and a half. This guy was a rookie tight end in the NFL last year, and he had 1,026 yards receiving last year. The sky is the limit. He's only going to get better in his route running and understanding how to be a professional athlete and also being a tight end in the NFL. And also taking a look here at George Kittle. 825 for George Kittle in a Kyle Shanahan offense. I still would trust George Kittle a little bit more than I would Pitts at the 875 only number. Only on Sports Grid. Man, I got to tell you, now 30 to 1 in the MVP race doesn't have you too far down the board. This market is booked in a fascinating way where 40 to 1 is somehow the longest number. That in of itself doesn't feel right to me, Donnie, but Cliff Kingsbury, 30 to 1. What do you think about that? Um, I mean, take a look at this. There's two guys at 40 to 1 right now. Uh, Andy Reid at 40 to 1 for the Chiefs, as if he's a terrible coach. And if they win it all, it's because, well, the Chiefs have Patrick Mahomes and he can't get in that race. Take a look at 40 to 1. You want to talk about a media darling if they win it all here? Tom Brady and Tampa Bay with Todd Bowles at 40 to 1. Tell me right now that Todd Bowles doesn't win coach of the year if the Bucs win it. You got it. He'd be a shoe in for it at this place. You see, look at those 40 to 1 guys with like a bad football team who have zero chance to win anything, like Pete Carroll, 40 to 1. But I do get a kick out of this every year. Like Brandon Staley's 14 to 1 leader in the clubhouse. <laughs> but why though? Like, Todd Bowles would be 14 to 1, a new coach in a great situation that everybody wants him to succeed. And if he does, he's not going to win it because Brandon Staley was ultra analytical and went for it on fourth down. So, hey, they missed the playoffs, but they went for it the correct amount of times on fourth down. That means something. You got to be kidding me. I mean, Brand, it doesn't even make any sense. Again, like, Brand, who books no. this market to put Brandon Staley on the front here? Why does everybody keep betting Brandon Staley? It does not make any sense. <laughs> Truthfully, it, it really, like, do they want Brandon Staley to be comeback player of the year? I, I don't, yes. like, it, and if you look at it, right, it's Brian Dable, new team, Doug Peterson, new team, Kevin O'Connell, new team, Nathaniel Hackett, new team, Mike McDaniel, new team. And then it's Brandon Staley and Dan Campbell. But at least again on Dan Campbell, it's like, yeah, well, they were the worst team in the NFL last year. Yeah. If they get a little bit better, all of a sudden there's juice. The Staley lane is what? Oh, they're going to win that AFC West. It makes no sense. It's incredible. We didn't talk about Cliff Kingsbury here at all. 30 to 1 doesn't have a lot of juice, clearly. Although I don't know how the longest odds are 40 to 1. That makes no sense. Hour two coming up. 